Thank you. Well, when I was asked to give the closing keynote, I thought, well, a closing keynote is always a difficult thing because everybody's been quite busy for several days. We've all had tons of technical talks, tons of discussions, and the brain tends to be somewhat overloaded. And now I'm supposed to give you an idea of what's ahead. And that is a difficult endeavor. I did some research um, and discovered that we have a very old and honorable tradition in our industry, if you will, which are predictions. So I picked some out, like this one, 1957. I have traveled the length and breadth of this country and talked with the best people and I can assure you that data processing is a fad that won't last out the year. There's another one. There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. 1977. Well, given that these were smart people making these predictions, I do feel a little better now adding one of my own and then seeing how this will work out in the end. Let me begin by talking about what gave the main name to this keynote, which is GPLv3. It's almost there. And Considering the fact that we heard so many things about how it was controversial, I would like to take a moment to point out what we did not hear, which is the fact that most of the changes that are in there were in fact uncontroversial. That for most of them, there was no problem, no big discussion. When it comes to the controversial changes, I believe that we are seeing essentially two main areas. One is software payments, which is our eternal, at least it seems that way right now, menace. I think Simon called it a zombie um, that keep, keeps coming back here in Europe, and indeed, that is how it feels. And since we don't know whether that zombie will succeed in Europe, and we know that it exists in the US, we need to do something about it. So there is a controversy in software patents. Although the main controversy does not so much seem to be in what people want to achieve, but rather in how to actually achieve it. The main controversy is not about what you want to do, it's more about how exactly do you have to write it so it does do that. And that turns out to be not so trivial. But to be honest, I personally am fairly confident that all the people involved in GPLv3 will be able to find a solution to that issue. The second point has been labeled Digital Restrictions Management DRM. Well, there is indeed a controversy here. Although, a part of that controversy I have found to be based on misinformation. Because people come up, but why do you want to forbid DRM on, I don't know, music? Well, while we think that is a bad idea, that is not what GPLv3 is about. In fact, the free software is defined by the four freedoms and one of them means unlimited use for any purpose. So no matter how mis misled we might consider a certain purpose, it would go against our principles to forbid usage for certain purposes. So this is not what GPLv3 does. It does not say you cannot build a DRM system for music with the software. The clause in GPLv3 is much more specific and in a different area. It's about DRM on the software, which is generally implemented in hardware. Richard likes to call this a TiVoization, 
after the device that is sold in the US, it's much less known in Europe, the TiVo, which is a piece of hardware that people think they buy and they put in their homes to record TV programs from the net, or rather from the air, but they get the data over the net. And in fact, the TiVo has software in there. It's based on the Linux kernel. The TiVo has software in there that says, I report back the viewing habits of the people who own me, or own me, to the company. Now, if somebody doesn't want to get spied upon, they could, in theory, take that software and modify it so it doesn't spy upon them anymore and run that instead. But in fact, that box does not allow this. It checks which software it is running and it will only run the software that the company authorized to run on the hardware. So while you think you own the hardware, you actually don't because you do not have the freedom to choose what you want to run on that hardware. And this is something that seems to be more and more common. We see indications that more people will be doing this in the future. And it goes against what we believe should be done, should be possible, should be allowed. We think people should have the freedom, if they buy a piece of hardware, to run the software that they want to run. We believe this is an important and fundamental freedom to have. And when you think just a couple of years into the future, when computers become more and more omnipresent, and we will have computers everywhere around us, even more than we do today, and we already have computers everywhere, at least that's how it seems. These computers control our lives, often down to very intimate details of our lives. Who should have the power to decide what these computers do? I believe it is the people that are actually affected by the computers and that believe that they own the computers. These people should be the ones to decide what is running on there. And I was discussing this earlier with Jeremy Ellison. You know, ultimately in, in a country like the US, all it would take is just one big virus sweep that takes out part of the US economy for a while you know, that creates one massive hit and the climate would indeed be in a way that the US might legislate that you can only have DRM hardware that every hardware that you sell must support this to, you know, ensure that there can be no more virus damage in Germany there is a discussion about allowing the government to tap into every machine having a Trojan that installs itself on machines of people that might or might not have done criminal activity and spies upon them without them noticing. With that kind of climate, we indeed face the possibility that such hardware might be forced upon us, that there might not be a choice anymore at some point, which means we need to prevent this now. And that is what GPLv3 is about, or this clause in GPLv3, to prevent that kind of scenario. And I know that this is not uncontroversial. I know that some people in this community also think differently about that issue. But I personally believe that ultimately the reasons for having this protection are as wise and as far-sighted as some of the other clauses that were in GPLv2 when it was written and that were controversial then. The status of the GPLv3 right now is that we are having a slight delay. That is in part certainly owed to the deal between Microsoft and Novell that all of you I guess have been reading about so I will not go into this in detail now. What I also want to tell you is that the next draft might be the last. It's not clear whether it will be, but it could be. And if everything runs perfectly, it might be actually. So calculate in that this might be the last draft that's coming up. 
So in case you have not yet looked at it, I would urge you to take a look at this now because if you want to comment, the time is running out. So you can participate at gplv3.fsf.org. That is where you should go, that is where you should look for the current drafts, that's where you should make your comments, and if you want to make comments, make them now, because the next draft might be the last one. So now look, let's look a little bit beyond what is actually you know, the drafting process. What will happen when GPLv3 actually comes out? You know, there will be a, I mean, no matter when it will be, but there will be a point in time when there is a published license, and this license is out there for use. And as far as that's concerned, I have heard many scenarios and theories. And, you know, there were wild predictions about how, you know, the earth would shake and there would be rain of fire. And it's, you know, a lot of them, I don't know. I, I have to say that there's always a problem. I love this quote, which is why I had to put it into this um, keynote somewhere. That in theory there is no difference between practice and three, but in practice there is. Which is a Yogi Berra. And I love this quote so much that it's just the wisdom in this I think is quite apparent. And in fact, what I believe, what my feeling for this is, is that what we will have is ultimately an adoption that will happen rather constructively and in several ways. I know there are people who would use the license immediately. Some people were even asking to use the drafts, which they shouldn't do because the draft is not a license. So I, you know, I know and many of us who have talked to people who would use GPLv3 immediately the moment it comes out. And some people will. The GNU project will do it for sure. Some people won't. Some people will wait and see how this works. If they see it works well, and I believe they will, they will use it as well. And I believe over several ways what we will see is an adoption of the GPLv3 that is much less noisy than the process of drafting. Because our community, I mean, face it, we like to argue. All of us have strong personalities and we are not exactly a dumb community. Um, in fact, some of the most brilliant minds I know are part of this community and brilliant people like to argue. So yes, we like to argue and argue we do. But this community is also rather pragmatic in various ways. And when the license is out there and it works and it does what we care about, people will use it. And that's what I'm extremely sure about. For companies, what I believe will happen is they will analyze the license. They will maybe wait a little moment, maybe do it immediately, but at some point they will analyze the license. They will see that it is solid and reasonable and they will start using it in their own business interest. I think that's exactly what's going to happen. So no, I don't think we're going to have earthquakes and rain on fire, but what I do believe will happen is that the debate on legal issues will shift a little bit. It will probably not be so pronounced anymore, but it will shift more towards the structural, towards the question of legal maintainability. And when I talk about legal maintainability, I talk essentially about the three main points, which is A, the ability to relicense. So the ability to actually update a license if necessary. I'm fairly certain that many of you will have heard the debate about whether or not one of the major projects in this community can or cannot change its license. I don't want to say anything about the fact whether or not that is possible, but what I want you to take from this is the fact that it is at times necessary to be able to make that decision 
and make it strongly and clearly and without question. Also, we need the ability to enforce our licenses. We have some projects that have been doing this incredibly successfully. Harald Welt of GPL violations would be somebody to mention in this context. The license is an expressed will of the people writing the software and it should be respected. And in fact, we need to find ways to make it more respected the more it gets abused. And with the value in free software and the unbelievable potential that is in the software that people in this room write and others around the world, people are tempted to abuse that. There's always somebody who is tempted to take something from the community and not adhere to its rules. And when that happens, we should be able to make sure that they play by the rules. When Simon Phipps says that they want to be stinking filthy rich with free software, fine. That is not the problem. As long as they play by the rules, everything is fine. And it's the same for everyone else. But we need them to respect the rules of the community, which are defined by our licenses. And projects should maintain a clear legal status. It should be clear that there is no copyright infringement, no patent issues on that code. Because otherwise what we see are attacks of the kind of scope that, granted, we were able to deflect it, but I also think we can expect the next one to be a little smarter, to have learned from the mistakes of the first one. And ultimately our only protection is to make sure that we are solid against this from the start. That means we need to pay a little bit of attention to this and that also means we need structures to take care of these issues. And one of these structures, just as one example because it's not the only one, is the Freedom Task Force of the Free Software Foundation Europe, which is based around expert teams of law and technology. Legal experts from around the world, together with technological experts, getting together to do this job. It's run by a full-time coordinator, Shane Copper. He's been giving a lightning talk yesterday about the Freedom Task Force. And its main areas of activity are license education, to make sure people understand the rules of our community, fiduciary services, helping to maintain a status where you know everything is clean and you can relicense if you have to, and license enforcement. That is what the Freedom Task Force does. Now, I think actually this is enough about law. It's Sunday. Some of you may know that I do martial arts and I've done it for many years. And um, when you do martial arts, you start to inherit a certain tendency to also look at the philosophical aspects of it. This is a, an image of Miyamoto Musashi, um, probably the most famous samurai of all time, and cultural reference to all of Japan until today. He was allegedly the inventor of the two-sword fighting style, and has written a book, the Book of the Five Rings, which until today remains an inspiration for many people. And you may ask yourself, why do I bring up this reference? Well, one of the things that Miyamoto Musashi taught was that success comes from doing the right thing at the right time. Doing too little or doing too much or doing it too early or too late can both be detriment detrimental whereas you need to have the right amount of things to do at the right time. And I believe we as a community are at a critical moment. It is the right time 
for us now. Because Microsoft Vista is shipping. And I am sure that many of you will have read reviews about it. In fact, the net is flooded with them. And I've had a look at some of them and picked a quote from one. If Vista's price, especially for Europeans, is its most eye-popping feature, its second most eye-popping feature is the Aqua, well, Aero desktop interface. Indeed, Aero looks nearly as good as KDE, although it demands about three times the system resources. <laughs> Think about this. I mean, KDE, one of our two main desktops. And this is a mainstream journalist saying that KDE kicks the hell out of Vista. That KDE looks better and is faster than Vista. Think about this three years ago, it would have been impossible. I think this is very significant. And when I read this, and in fact the whole article is worth reading, it's quite funny. Um, you know, on specific requests, I mean, the, the article talks about lots of things, the immortal craplets that are not possible to kill, because when you kill one, it tells you that you should have killed it, and that itself becomes an immortal craplet that doesn't go away. It's a very, very funny article. But the most important thing here is to understand what this means for us. Microsoft is unbelievably under pressure. The Vista technology is weak. I've not read a single article that said that anybody was technologically impressed. It is incredibly expensive. And it has gone way out of its way to cripple itself to suit the needs of the RM. Because it thought that if it did that, the media industry, the music industry, would love it so much that it would make it its favorite platform and use its power to push it everywhere. So they could control all the channels. For that, it had crippled itself through DRM. The irony here is, that DRM is increasingly unpopular. If you read the statements, even from people in the music industry, and I'm just thinking about the IMF, the International Music Managers Forum here, for instance, they say DRM is dead. Give it two years' time, it's out of the window. It doesn't work. People hate it. So they have spent years of time crippling themselves for something that nobody wants. And there's another thing. This is another quote that I dug out from 95. The antitrust thing will blow over. Bill Gates. That ain't quite so. In fact, the EC antitrust work, and you have a fantastic time, because these two guys were incredibly important in putting pressure on Microsoft in Europe in the antitrust case. Without the help from the Samba team, the technical expertise to explain how Microsoft deliberately obstructed interoperability willfully, just for the purpose of obstruction, <coughs> the work would not have been possible and they would not be so much more And that work is gaining momentum. They're currently being fined and fined over and over again. Because for them, the worst thing that would happen is that actually people were able to interoperate. Because you see, 
Actually, I, I'm, I've seen that also in your talk, Jeremy, and you're quite right. The desktop is where it is decided. The desktop is where the power is. The desktop drives all the stuff that is behind. And Microsoft has been abusing that power massively. And that's why this is the right time. This is the right time to bring free software to the desktop. Microsoft has never been weaker. They've never been weaker than today on that front. We now have the chance to actually win the desktop. Because people need to migrate. They need to upgrade at some point in time. And heck! You know, while they're doing it, why don't they upgrade to something nice, like new Linux with KDE, which looks better and is faster? You know? There is no reason why they shouldn't do that. Or rather, there's one point where we have to strategically work now to get that done. And that is the right action. There's a global push for open standards. And last year at the Internet Governance Forum, I was on a podium with Susie Struble from Sun Microsystems, which is working a lot on the open standards issues for Sun. And she said, and I found this a lovely quote, one person's rant, reasonable and non-discriminatory licensing terms, is another person's bankruptcy. Because these rant terms generally are quite discriminatory and normally quite expensive. The situation we are in right now is that we have various standard definitions. We have various definitions of what actually is an open standard. Some of them by now are pretty good. There's a particular one that is not so bad that is here in Europe from the European Interoperability Framework, the EIF. That is not at all a bad definition. It may not be perfect, but it's not bad at all. In Denmark, we have another definition that's not so bad. It's quite good, actually. And we see a convergence and interest and a coalition by now. To make that definition something along these lines, it should be publicly documented and accessible so people can actually get to the specification. It should be freely implementable. There should be no strings to implement that open standard. And it should be maintained by an independent organization, not just by one company. These are criteria that more or less are by now shared and accepted by a large part of industry, except Microsoft, essentially. Um, and I believe that this is indeed what we can make the definition of an open standard. Personally, I would add one thing which is a free software reference implementation. That is something that I would really like to see entered into this. Because we have, and I might once more bring back the Yogi Berra quote here, we have seen that in theory um, open standards depend on certain things, but we've also seen that in practice it's not so easy to actually have an open standard that really interoperates. And in fact, you know, that's why you have plug fests and um, occasions where you try to interoperate with each other to see where does it break. If you have a free software reference implementation, that process has helped a lot. So I think this is indeed a worthwhile thing. And in fact, Susie told me in a discussion that she wouldn't have a problem with that at all. That from some perspective, that is not a problem. So we have an open standards convergence, and that is quite central because, you see, open standards are currently the door into governmental use. 
every single government on this planet is currently saying they want open standards. You can see it in the World Summit on the Information Society declaration, we want open standards. You see it in the Internet Governance Forum, we want open standards. You see it in various national publications, you see it on the European Commission level, everybody says they want open standards. And because that is so, we have seen the struggle between ODF and OpenXML. There is a strategic point behind this. It is, if you will, a subvertive attack. It is an attempt to establish something, in this case, OpenXML, as sufficiently open standard to be acceptable to then make those criteria the ones that should be applied to everything else, essentially subverting the open standard definition. And that is why we've been working on that field pretty strongly. Because once that happens, or if that were to happen, they could also bring in similar proprietary standards that only they can implement, and also claim that they were open standards, fulfilling what all the governments are crying for. This really is the key turning point at the moment. This is one of the critical key issues. And this can be our game. I mean, free software is uniquely suited in many ways to interoperate. Because we can change the software. And many people argue, rightly so, that with free software the lock-in can never be perfect because even if that project were to discontinue, people could go and see how the code actually did this and read the same format. That is true. There will never be a perfect lock-in with free software. And that is why this is an area where we have home field advantage. The Free Software Foundation Europe is working in various fora, together with others. I mean, at the Internet Governance Forum, we are part of the dynamic coalition on open standards. And we help that push and that conversion upon a definition that will work for us, that will help us as the free software community. But there's one thing that we as a community have to do, which is we have to become a little more aware of open standards ourselves. If there is an open standard for whatever your projects do, support it. Because once you do, that opens the door to massive adoption by governments. Once you take that step, there's almost no argument left against your projects. At that point, it becomes a pure economics game. If there's money in it, there are large companies that are willing to make money with this. This can be our game. And you see, this is a moment in time where we pick our quotes. And in fact, I mean, I have a feeling Bill Gates read different reviews than me, but this is one I've, I found from two or three days ago, given to Reuters. I don't know what you mean. This has had an incredible reception. The reviews have been fantastic. This is a big, big advance to the Windows platform. It's the world's most used piece of software. Overall, the reliability feedback has been well better than we expected. Huh. You know, that's either serious denial of reality <laughs> or it tells us something about their expectations for how well Vista would be received. <laughs> or it is trying to establish a self-fulfilling prophecy. And since Bill Gates ain't so dumb, and we may think about him what we want, but he's not that dumb, I believe it is the last. Which is why I offer you a second quote here. 
Sandwiched between Vista problems, antitrust issues, and the global push for open standards, Microsoft will increasingly lose the initiative. Free software will start to cut into the desktop monopoly from which Microsoft has previously exerted force to conquer neighboring markets. Eventually, Microsoft will be forced to fundamentally rethink its business model in favor of free software. Ultimately, I believe we are at a turning point, and ultimately I think we get to pick our quote. With all the things that are going on in the growth of this community, I think we are truly at a turning point, and we can choose which way we want to go. So we can make that choice this year, and I hope we will. Thank you very much. All right, do we have questions, discussions, um, comments? Anybody? was um, ultimately what can people do to support the work of FSFE and the work against software patents? Well, I mean, I like that question, obviously. Um, there's various ways to support our work. The first and most easy one to begin with is to join the fellowship, in case if you do that in time, you even have the chance to win some nice gadgets as a little reward. So, to do that, go to www.fsfe.org and sign up. And I hope that many of you will do that if you haven't done so already. Secondly, we always need people to help us with the work on these issues and help us and our allies as well. There's many groups, in particular software patents, because that was the context in which you asked the question, is an issue where we've been working with a huge coalition. And there's various groups that do that work. The FFII is very central in this. So get in touch with whatever group you feel most comfortable with working with and work with them. Because ultimately, you know, fighting for freedom is fun, but it's also quite a bit of work. And, you know, we like to do this work. We do it gladly. But, we really need help. Because we're just a few people doing what we can against a very well-funded monopoly. So, our work can make the difference. And in fact, if you want to get active, for instance, the software patent work that we do here in Brussels, Kiron, would you just please stand up for a second? Kiron is FSFE's representative here in Brussels, and he's the guy you should talk to if you want to work with us on that. Because he is our main person. We hired him full time to work for us here in Brussels against software patents at the um, peak of the debate. And so, you know, the fellowship has funded actually his work. So, you know, by joining the fellowship, you would already help, but if you want to do more, there's always ways. Get involved, talk to us, approach us. We are always glad to have more people work with us. And I know the same is true for other organizations as well. I, I just see the newly appointed EFF representative here in Europe, Eric, who's been a strong force in the software patent debate as well. We have various groups who work together on these issues. Our strength comes from collaboration, just like normal in the free software world. So we don't do this work alone, we don't claim to do it alone. We do it as a 
community, of organizations ultimately, of people who share these interests. So please, you know, help us do this work because ultimately those of us who have understood the issues have a responsibility to act upon them because a large part of society has not understood that these issues exist in the first place. That means that for us who have understood the issues, the responsibility is greater and we should not wait for others to do that work. We should make sure that we do that work together. Do we have other questions? Please. Alright, um, essentially the um, question is about the fact that um, there are indeed um, strong parts of corruption in the process. Um, and in this case, particularly the UK were presented in the BBC with their very tight cooperation with Microsoft, which is um, Yes, indeed, very tight, um, very cozy, very snug, but it gets increasingly harder to do these things without creating um, a public debate. And if there is no public debate that happens automatically, then we may have to create one. Um, you know, public debates don't just arise, you can actually bring them about. And I believe in this case in particular, it is a very easy debate for us to have. Because it should not be the role of any government or any public broadcaster to mandate the use of any certain operating system in any way. In particular, if that operating system is a convicted monopolist. I mean, in this case, you have a convicted monopolist tracked down by the Commission, prosecuted by the European Commission, and you want to force people to use their software. That is a debate that indeed for us is relatively easy to win. And the outcome of that debate and the position with which you can always win that debate, even against the most die-hard conservative politicians, is to say, we don't want to force you to use that something else, what we want is a system that everybody can use equally well, and then you always end up at the open standard issue again. Just say, we want something that we can all do equally well. We don't even need to force them to use free software, because once they do everything equally well, we are in a situation where we can say, look, you can choose this or that. You have the freedom of choice. With open standards, you can suddenly say, oh, you know, we can replace that part of the system by another piece of software. And then, seriously, who in their right mind would choose anything but free software once they have understood the issues? Open standards can help us to overcome the lock-in effect that is currently keeping 
quite a few people trapped. And that is indeed what we should do. I've seen another question there, yes. Interesting. Just to, to repeat the question, it was about whether or not we can adopt a more proactive approach instead of a reactive one, as we have done with so many issues, including, for instance, software patents and so on. Um, yes, I, I actually completely agree with you, and this is something that occurred to me a couple of years ago as well, that we need to be more proactive on the issue. Although we've actually been working on open standards, before OpenXML became an issue. Um, so this was something where we proacted because we understood that this was something where we could make a turning point. Um, but, in fact, I know several others in this room have as well. I know Andres Sagat has been working on open standards for a long, long time. Um, so yes, I completely share your feeling about this issue. And indeed, I think Musashi would also tell us that always just defending, always just being reacting to another attack is not exactly wise. Should we tell people about freedom and our vision for how that future should look? Yes. And we've been doing that. We've been doing that for years. Um, in fact, we've been doing it so much that some people told us, you know, why are you repeating that message so often? Um, but Ultimately, we think the message still has not got far enough. I mean, in this community, certainly, everybody has at some point heard what we had to say about free software and software freedom and how we think that future should look. But I am realistic enough to understand that that is not true for everybody. That there are people outside this room that have never heard this. And I believe we need to get to those people. We need to be able to explain it to them and we need to spread the knowledge to them, ultimately. And yes, I believe that this is one of the most important things that we can do, which is why Free Software Foundation Europe actually is one of its core activities and, and identifying criteria has had the long-term creation of awareness, of bringing knowledge outside this group that has this knowledge and making sure that others understand it. So yes, I believe that is what we should do. There's other activities, for instance, like trying to get um, a better patent legislation proactively. They could work, although they obviously have the danger that the other side can do exactly what we did and try to co-opt that approach. And we find ourselves basically in a very similar battle again. But yes, all of these things can be done and some of them should be done. Yes, please. Uh-huh. I'm not sure I got the question entirely. Sorry, it's a little silent. Let me come to you. At the beginning of the talk, you talked about the TiVo device, which doesn't permit other software to be installed on it. How will free software or uh, the GPL or another license restrict a device to act like that? So you want to know how GPL v3 prevents that? Well, I mean, ultimately, um, GPL v3, to my knowledge, is the only license that plans to have something like this. 
um, although other licenses might possibly follow that example. Um, the way GPLv3 tries to do this ultimately is to say that you don't just have to give the freedoms on paper, you know, on the license, but actually in reality, which means you have to give people what they need to make the software run. If you create your device in a way that it has those restrictions, that it will only run certain software, then for the people who get that device with GPLv3 software, you will also have to give them whatever they need to make it run. That is essentially how GPLv3 will try to address that issue. Um, other licenses, as far as I know, don't do that. Um, it might be a good idea if, if they actually started doing it. I think that might be useful. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you, if you are still free to build whatever device you want and write a piece of proprietary software and stuff it in there. I mean, what? Oh, yeah, I mean, GPLv2 doesn't protect against this kind of scheme, really, so you could still, you know, fork off all GPLv2 projects or write proprietary software or take other code. Um, but GPLv3 itself will no longer permit that. Bonjour. Sorry, can you say it louder? Bah. That's a really tricky question. What's the position of the central court for patents in Europe? Um, I have to admit that that's a question that's currently beyond me because so many things would depend on how exactly it is done um, that in the end, I mean, the problem right now is if you have a European patent, you can't invalidate it in the same way that you can get it. Um, you, you have to squash it, all the countries individually, ultimately, to get rid of it. Um, if a central court allowed us to squash that centrally as we can get them centrally, that would be a good thing. The problem, though, is how will it be implemented and who will control it? I mean, it's, it all comes down not so much about how we have the structure, whether or not the central one is fine or not. The question is how exactly it works. I mean, even the European Patent Office might work if it stayed out of software to begin with, and also if it had a controlling instance that actually controlled it and could hold it responsible, which it doesn't, and that's the big problem. So it's more a structural issue of how you implement this, I believe, than whether or not that structure exists. I think. You have, you have to talk ultimately about the details to really know whether I'm pro or against. Um, I prefer a method to get rid of patents quickly and eff effectively if they're in the area of software, that would be very good. But if that method is so flawed that it doesn't work, then I'd be against it because we'd be worse off than before because it would seem like there's a way to get rid of them when there really is none. Um, and that would really only make our position worse. Therefore, um, the answer would be it depends. <coughs> yes, please. Well, I am not a lawyer, so I take what I say with a certain amount of salt. But, I know that in several countries, it is not possible to license under a license that does not yet exist, so that you could not have known at the time when you have licensed. Therefore, um, that decision could probably be taken apart in some courts on this planet, some of which would be in Europe. Um, so, if you understood your argument correctly, you were saying you did this because you wanted the web clause in there, the web service stuff. Have you considered using the Affero GPL? 
Okay, so you've licensed it under um, a FIRO GPL saying that um, the automatic upgrade would be GPL v3, essentially, if I understand what you, what you did. Well, I, I think that is probably okay enough, anyway, um, because hopefully none of you will die immediately, um, which means that by the time when GPL v3 comes out, you should be around to be able to actually say, we like this license and we now license this officially under this license, and that's what you should do once it is out. Um, until then, it will be under a favor GPL, which is you know, perfectly fine for that purpose. Therefore, I think it should be fine. Yes, this is a very common, and I, I know that you probably have an answer to this, and I will just bring it to you just after a short comment. Um, yes, this is a very common practice everywhere on this planet, um, that Microsoft is secretly using its market power to force vendors to not sell equipment without a Microsoft license. Um, the big problem being that while they will tell you this in private, um, if they trust you enough. They would never say so in public, just like any other victim of blackmail is afraid of the public. Um, so it is very hard to do anything about this. One of our, the, our Swiss team, in fact, um, notified the Swiss and antitrust authorities of this kind of bundling, um, because you, in Switzerland you can launch investigations anonymously, which is quite nice. Um, and they will have to investigate. So we ditched that ball in there, and I believe if other people do the same thing, and we keep pointing to that problem, we will find some evidence at some point that they can actually use. But this is very difficult. There are, however, fortunately, sometimes some people who resist that fight, um, and, but they are very hard to find. Personally, I would recommend to go with one of the free software companies that um, pre-installs Moon Linux. Some of them are not able to get hardware without that tax. Um, some of them sometimes find some hardware without the tax. Um, one of them I know is Xtops in Germany, Werner Häuser, who um, has always, you know, is always seeking machines that come without the tax, so he can actually sell and pre-install with Moon Linux. Um, I don't know whether anyone exists here. I mean. Do you have something on that? No, but the ultimate installation is quite good. So I managed to get a 90 year old back on there. So we have to follow the rules. I mean, I have to write a registered letter in the first seven days after the arrival. And then I also send back the media, also registered. Did you, did you document how exactly you did it? This sounds like something we could put on the fellowship side, actually, in the form of some interactive um, piece of um, information where people can put their experience and how to do it in the different countries. So if you email us what you've done, maybe we'll put it on the fellowship side and then other people can also put their stuff there. That might be a good idea. And then you'll find it under fsfe.org, um, how to do that stuff. So if you email me that stuff, we'll put it there and then everybody can find it. There's one more. Last one? All right, you're the last.
Well, um, the question was about GPLv3 and the additional clauses that you can put in there, um, and the question of whether that would create a similar problem as we see with Creative Commons, or rather, you know, saying this is under Creative Commons licensing, because that's also a bunch of very different licenses. First of all, I should say that I think it would be a mistake to compare Creative Commons and Free Software because they're not the same thing. I also believe they have different goals. Um, whereas Free Software is already a butterfly, Creative Commons is still a caterpillar. Because, you know, in Free Software we know what are the base freedoms. We know exactly. These, this is the bottom line of freedom that we cannot go below. This is the minimum we must have. Creative Commons doesn't have that. Creative Commons is, is like opening the door to a dialogue to find out how much freedom you need for which area. So the two are at very different stages of the discussion in their various areas. The main criticism that Richard had about Creative Commons was that people said, oh, this is okay because it's Creative Commons license, and some Creative Commons licenses are indeed relatively non-free. I mean, from my personal perspective, I would consider them proprietary. Now, that will never be true for GPLv3, because none of the things that you can add to GPLv3 will turn it into a proprietary software license. The things that you can add to it are crafted in a way that they define a space of potential additional clauses, but that space is clearly in the domain of free software. And one of the ideas of why that was done is to make sure that you could have more license compatibility also. Because you had the issues that the GPL v2 was involuntarily incompatible with some other licenses. It, you know, it was not something that people wanted, but at the time when GPL v2 was written, those licenses simply did not exist. So, you know, there was no way to be compatible with them because nobody knew what they were going to look like. And understanding that people will still write licenses in the future, the decision was to go with a set of clauses and ways of making different decisions on different issues that are okay for GPLv3 because that will allow to be compatible with the licenses in that area that is defined by those clauses, even if they are written in the future. So instead of having an explicit compatibility list to say, you know, we'll be um, compatible with X, Y, Z, you say, we are compatible with licenses in this area. They are okay. And I personally think that was one of the quite intelligent decisions in GPLv3 and so far as it allows to increase compatibility. Um, but no matter what kind of clause you add, all the ones that are allowed to add, that are legal to add, will still end up being a free software license. But yes, I can see why you feel a little uneasy about the fact that it's no longer so easy to know what exact terms you're getting then. Um, and I know that some other people also have similar concerns. Um, we'll see how that plays out in the end. I mean, people are discussing this at the moment. And in fact, I encourage you to put in your comments. I mean, if in case you haven't done so already, you submit them. You know, it, um, I think it, it's very valuable to also see, you know, how many people are concerned about this and how exactly would that problem exist or not exist and how to um, work it out. So, you know, if anyone else has that feeling, please submit your comments. <coughs> so, since that was the last question, I'm going to close this now, but not without thanking the Fosdem team and everybody for this really nice event. I love Fosdem. I've been here since 2002, I believe, every year. Um, this one is the first one where the network actually worked on the first day. Um, and I think we're doing a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you.